Okay, thank you all very much. Um, thank you first to the, for all of you for coming, for, especially for Aaron for organizing it. And I must say, I really enjoyed uh, hearing the speakers this morning and this afternoon. Um, it's been a little tale of calamities actually getting here. I lost my computer that my original presentation was on about three or four days ago. Then coming through customs, I'd have found I'd lost my um, declaration between Ireland and the US. So I was wander wandering around uh, US customs in the, in the, under the guidance of one of your security officials for a while, wondering would I ever get here. And then I found that the representation I'd been working on had partially collapsed. So this is, um, it gets truncated later on, but we're going to ad lib. So I want to begin with a story. Yeah. The, I spent quite a bit of time in Kyrgyzstan, in Central Asia. And here are some people, they're doing a shardak with wool from mountain goats. And one of the things about these people is, firstly, they're pretty self-sufficient. They would be what are classically regarded as the people living on between one and two dollars a day. And <clears throat> one of their great sources of uh, cash income are their apple trees. And in the village next door to here, there were 49 varieties of apple in one village. It's the origin of where apples come. And all of that is there. And here is a woman sorting apples. And that's something I did, because I had a friend who is doing her PhD down the road in Ann Arbor, who is an ethnobiologist studying these things. And one of the problems, unofficial problems, of these apples is that some are rather bitter. And some are gnarly, and some are prone to pests. And this, to the people, they're well able to deal with it. Some are sold for cash, makes up about 30 to 40, 50% of their income, depending, of over a year. And some they eat and dry. And some are effectively fed to the animals. They're, a, they're pretty useless and that. So that is how their economy works. And they grow some other things in these gardens, but really the apples are what their big cash crop. Now, what happens if you are a poor country and rich countries become interested in you is that they come to tell you how to do things properly, to show you the way. And it so happened at this time that the place, probably it is, still is, infested with NGOs from across the developed world coming to save people from terrorism, from themselves, from poverty, etc. And they're on the lookout, because that's how they keep going, for opportunities. And here was the opportunity. The opportunity was, this is incredibly inefficient. All of these apples going to waste. So they came up with a plan, looking at their general agriculture, and they said, we'll give you great trees big, juicy apple trees that you'll be able to make juice from, added value, and we all know that's great. Um, we'll give you fertilizer and pesticides. You're partially going to, you're going to need it for the trees, but partially um, you know, we'll help you grow other things at a greater level of productivity. And finally, we're going to fund it through loans and microfinance. And this was when it originally clicked for me, because I knew about climate change. I'd started reading about peak oil. I knew a little bit about economics. And it was, ah, this is how you become trapped. You go into this situation. Let's say it didn't happen because my friend and others said, you can't do this to this biodiversity. But look what this, uh, the situation would have been if they had gone ahead with it. Firstly, being the poorest, they would have made more money, of course. They're growing now super apples. They're getting a bigger cash income. And they're sending their children maybe off to Bishkek, to the, the capital, to uh, study to, in the university, where they'll hopefully, uh, well, they won't get a job, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> and <clears throat> they now have more income, debt, reduced uh, biodiversity, 
and a dependency on fertilizers. And you think, OK, what happens if the oil price rises? These are the last people who can afford. These are the people on the margins. What happens if there's major climate events? What was before was a hedging, the natural hedging strategy for changing weather, et cetera, now becomes their trap. They've got one thing. If it goes wrong, it goes wrong. These people have nothing to fall back on. So if there is any event, be it climatic or be it rises in fossil fuel prices, not only can they not go back, but they're stuck in debt. And here is that simple thing of how we start to become entwined in the world by making simple decisions that seem right. You start to be in a position where you can no longer go back. Because if you stop using fertilizers, your productivity crashes. So you're everything going wrong all at once. Oh, sorry. Oh, here. So here's just a few things. Firstly, the people who come to give their wisdom are very much, excuse my spelling if you see, see any misspellings, um, history has a direction. And it's about progress and about growth. And it's about we all want to be developed, whatever that is, that sort of narrative. Secondly, we're the director. You know, it's our brilliance that brought us to this point, our creative intellectual brilliance. And if you're going and telling other people how to do it right, it's great ego boost to your own narrative of your own um, heroic uh, position in the world. Lock-in is generally the ability or your inability to change one thing in a very complex system without starting to affect something else that you depend on. And in a very complex world like we live in, this could be, and I'll give some examples later, this could be really because we're dependent on constant flows of things through our system to keep us alive, to keep the, the, the light on, et cetera. Um, anything that you do too major to your economic system, consciously, even if you could comprehend the complexity, could quite likely start kick you around the back of the head in a way you didn't notice. You have very little room for maneuver. Um, irreversibility. This is a thermodynamic term. This is about energy, but it's also a very real thing. You can't go back. You don't just, removing those things doesn't bring us back to where we were before. And here is an example. If you imagine that all the Intel chips, just, no, this isn't a realistic thing, just you know, all the Intel chips introduced in the last 10 years, let's say they just failed. We wouldn't be back to where we were 10 years ago. We would have no grid, our banking system would go down, we would have a food security crisis, we would have major social unrest. You ask the question, how can something that's only 10 years in the system, because you're giving that cutoff, cause such chaos? We were fine before it. And this is about that sort of emergence and change and interconnectedness. So when we're going to talk about collapse, I'm going to be very specific and say, well, not that specific, and say, what's collapsing is the globalized economy. OK, so the first thing we might say, what is? Well, it's an integrated thing. It's an integrated accessing, storing, processing, and distribution system with associated infrastructure. And it's what all of us are tied together by. And it also is what ties together China and Ireland and the United States. It's what, you know, from Zambia to, um, you know, Peru, we're all part of it, more or less. And our measure of being part of it is also our system dependency on it. It's delocalized. Now, we are very much, because we're human, we like the human narrative, we're prone to the human narrative and drama of my country, the American government, the American economy, the Irish economy. But what we mean by the globalized economy is something different. It's an emergent property of all of these economies acting together so that it has an independence and a life beyond our economy, individual economies. And while all individual economies in some way help to, to be part of it, um, its dynamics and what it provides and distributes is globalized, truly. 
It maintains our globalized civilization, and that is really the globalized economy and all the things it gives and our narratives and worldviews that grew up in the expectation that this is normal, that this is what happens. Um, we can say it's been growing in complexity, and we heard uh, from uh, Professor Tainter and uh, Nicole Foss uh, some of the things about that. There's all sorts of ways we can define it, but it keeps growing. More integration, et cetera, et cetera. It's self-organizing. It's like those birds in flight. They don't know about aerodynamics of flight. They didn't set out to form a narrow shape. Each bird adapted in its own position with maybe a sense of hierarchy, but also just the path of least effort, the easiest position to be in. And what emerges is a macro structure. And that's the same for our globalized economy. It is lots of uh, institutions, individuals, people, formations, even ideas, and um, all sorts of identity groups, physical groups, interacting together. There's nothing in control, but there are common bonds or paths of interaction through infrastructures, historical narratives, cultural narratives, etc. Um, that means that nobody controls the, the global economy. It means nobody controls your economy or my economy, the one that I live in in Ireland. It is a coalescence at any moment of various pressures, pushes, this is and that's, most of which we're unaware of. So when we ask, why won't the government do something, and we combine that with our, what we say about lock-in and about self-organization, we start to get to think, governments can't do anything because they can't do anything. And the reason we talk, we talk grandly is because actually their main job is to keep the things stable and to stop by electors or other things, disturbing a momentary equilibrium. Because it's far easier to destroy something than it is to actually build complexity. You know, there's many more ways to break things than there are to build it. So that is the function of government, or all of us to some degree in any part of the system. We've heard about supply chains, and we've heard about lock-in. Now, lock-in, really, one of the, the major one is the growth economy. You know, uh, we may know it's killing us in many ways, but we can't move out of it because it's too complex. And if we started pulling the plug in our monetary system, you know, it's quite likely we'd have a food crisis. So these are some of the features. There are many more. But I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, going back a little bit. And here are two pictures. They're actually a little bit later than the period I'm talking about. But you get the idea. This poor little village, hovel, the roof falling in, and this woman out uh, working hard in the fields. Now, the reason I'm choosing France is because, you know, we're back about 1700, 18th century. We're thinking France is a really, you know, it's part of the developing, busy new world. It's got Versailles. It's got start the beginnings of great mathematicians and all of this sort of thing is going on. It's a happening place. Well, history gives us the happening place, at least in its headlines. But in the back print, we realize most people were very poor, very disconnected, and weren't getting up to much in terms of you know, the wide French culture. There were approximately, most people were uh, rural, 18 general famines and hundreds of local famines in the 18th century. Why was that? Well, if you are local, localized, and self-sufficient, um, you have a problem of if there's a bad flood, it, flood or anything like that, what happens? You bear all the cost yourself. You've got no reserves. You don't have cash, which you might exchange with someone else. You don't have markets. You don't have transport links. You don't have the infrastructure in which to manage those risks. Um, so, you know, storage limitations, you just remain poor. Now, one of the great things about starting to link up with other towns, with transport, with the money, which not, it can be your universal, not just store of wealth, but it's a token that you can all work with together, markets and institutions, is that your risks are shared. And now, if there's a crisis in one place, Boom, it's dispersed towards the others, and you hopefully can survive. But that's not really the biggest 
benefit in terms of how people saw the evolution of um, globalization. Um, if you have a surplus and you start to have roads and things, you start to sell your surplus, it's the most efficient use of it. If you've got money, you can store it. As the network gets bigger, because this is of a benefit, you can start to build markets. If people are cooperating, um, you start to have specialization. And because you have a bigger market, I can, somebody can specialize in very particular things because you start to need foci for people to do their transactions. You start to bring people together. They can start to do more complex things. They can start to have more surpluses because you're finding more efficiencies and new productivity. So knowledge, technology, levels of integration, all of these start to grow. And it starts to bring this cycle, this spiral of benefits. Uh, now, network size, of course, you can bring people in, but have you seen the other way to grow your network is to just go and grab it. Um, and uh, that has a long history, of course, as well. But the real thing that all of these need are they need increasing energy and increasing resources. So we drive this around and we keep growing. Provided your energy and your resources are on top, you know, this, there's no reason why this process shouldn't keep growing, getting bigger and bigger, until you either get sort of severe declining marginal returns, you get issues in energy, or you have some sort of internal dynamics to the whole system. 